Great. All right, great. Thank you all for coming out today for the seminar this week from chefs. Um, we are really happy to have Michael Kofed from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point here. Uh, Michael got his PhD in economics from the University of Georgia. Uh, he was trained as a labor economist, does a lot of work in the economics of education, has published really well. But his work has appeared in the uh, Journal of Human Resources, Contemporary Economic Policy, and Research in Higher mm -hmm. Education as well. Um, so today he's uh, dabbling in a, a health policy related topic. We were talking about a, 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 all I do is dabble. So it's nice to have a fellow dabbler here. Um, so uh, Michael's going to present his work uh, called the Affordable Soldier Act, the effect of the Affordable Care Act dependency mandate on job lock in the U.S. Army. So thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me out. Like uh, Joe said, most of the stuff I do is in economics of education. And I, I tell my students that sometimes I'm like the dog and up. It's my children's favorite movie right now. So that whenever some good identification strategy runs by, I'm kind of like squirrel, you know, run off over here. So, but, but so this is my, one of my first forays or dabbling into the econ or health economics. And so, uh, and just kind of as a plug, this started as an undergraduate thesis with Wyatt Frazier, who's my co-author. Wyatt is now a, a second lieutenant stationed in San Antonio, Texas, training to be a med services uh, officer or a hospital administrator essentially for the army and so uh, I, I think we kind of influenced his branch choice or job choice by working on some health policy stuff together so but of course before we get started uh, I always have to do this acknowledgement or disclaimer kind of like working for the Federal Reserve so first the data comes from the Office of Economic and Manpower Analysis also known as OEMA that's housed at West Point and in the process I'll tell you a little bit more about what OEMA does and also kind of the data that we have available that Joe's familiar with and works with as well. And then of course the views expressed are those of the authors and do not reflect the position of West Point, uh, the Department of the Army, or the Department of Defense, right? So uh, if, if they disagree with me, uh, the disclaimer's there, and if they like it, they'll probably take full credit for the paper anyway. <laughs> so. But the motivation for this paper, you know, it was really interesting. I've always, when I took health economics as a graduate student and labor economics, I was really fascinated by this idea of job lock, right? Especially like you have these families, if you're not familiar with job lock literature, that are, that are they go, they get a job, something happens, uh, maybe they have a pre-existing condition, for example, and so they feel like they're stuck in their job for the health benefits and are afraid to leave their job because they'll have, they won't let those benefits, uh, won't be portable for them. And so during the ACA, of, uh, this is before the hashtag fake news era, right? But uh, the 2014, the CBO released this idea that the Affordable Care Act had cost like 10 million jobs. And so, of course, the spin was really interesting. So this is a... This is from the Washington Post, Democrats on Obamacare jobs decline, it reduces job lock, was the way it was spun by Nancy Pelosi. Uh, this is MSNBC, when the ACA ends job lock, it's a feature, not a bug, okay? And of course, this is from The Hill, which is more conservative, CBO, two million jobs worth of hours lost under Obamacare, right? Very different perspectives on the exact same uh, CBO article that came out. Uh, again, Nancy Pelosi that day stated, yesterday the CBO projected that by 2021 the Affordable Care Act will enable two million peep workers to escape job lock. And, and then it further kind of this quote was taken onto the talk radio to drop the lock so then it was freeing people from their jobs is where this came from, right? But uh, enable two million workers to escape job lock, the situation where workers remain tied to employers for access to health care benefits. And then my home state senator, or in, uh, well this is from US World News Report, for Affordable Care Act became law, 11 potential freelancers were tied to their jobs they did not want, solely because they needed access to employer provided benefits, a phenomenon coined job lock. And then my home state senator, Orrin Hatch, said the same day when the president's health care law hurts the labor force at the same time it increases health care premiums and taxes, it's clear the law is not working for Americans, the CBO's latest report confirms yet another broken promise and negative consequences. Was there, <laughs> so, and I'll just not, well, 
Were similar arguments made for Medicaid expansions for low-income workers? Was was this because I, I recall job lock being right. an important part of the conversation with with the Affordable Care Act? Have, 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 have there been similar political arguments made about about Medicaid expansions? You know, I assume so because I think when these quotes are coming together, it's really take, talking about the ACA as kind of the whole, mm -hmm. right? So this is post. This is a few years after the ACA is passed. I. I, I Having worked at a state legislature, sometimes I doubt the ability of policymakers to slice that nuance so tightly. But I think that could be, there are some Medicaid expansion papers that kind of go after both this job lock okay. story as well, because we're maybe worried about low income workers being stuck in their jobs and the Medicaid expansion, particularly for single males or folks without dependents. Just historically, with the introduction right. of Medicaid, Medicaid. In the first place. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that, would, that would maybe I would lean on Brandy's knowledge then on that one, so. Medicaid income eligibility expansions, and the results have been pretty mixed on job lock. Sure. So it's, it's kind of in this bag. Um, and then I think one thing is that you know, these are really low income people. Not all of them have jobs that provide insurance, so that's right. one thing. And then another argument is that a lot of people on Medicaid are fairly sick, and maybe they're kind of not that sensitive. Um, we have to change this in terms of options. In terms of Some form of adverse selection story, right? Like people that already are sick might be picking up the Medicaid. And, yeah, I mean, they're right. just not able to work whether or not you give them an outside health insurance option, some of them. Sure. So, yeah. So. No, and that's really helpful because I'm going to make an argument. So it's really important when we use Army data to try to set it apart from just doing like a RAND style study, which is important, but why should we care? outside the Pentagon and outside the DOD. And it's because what I'm going to try to make an argument and convince you of here soon is those points that Brandy brought up are solved by using Army data, essentially. We can avoid some of these traditional problems in the job lock literature by, because of the special setting of how the Army is structured. But, but it's just like kind of it's an interesting idea that what we have here, when we think, think about both sides of this debate, is that it's really this conflation between supply and demand for labor, right? So one rule of thumb could be, or one idea could be that the Affordable Care Act raises the cost of hiring, which would be kind of more what maybe Senator Hatch is trying to get at here. So there's a lot of mandates in the Affordable Care Act that could push up the wage, wage being salary plus benefits higher than marginal product of labor. So I let go of a lot of workers. There was this discussion about having to have mandated benefits. If I have a firm with more than 20 workers, well then we, the claim was, well then we're just gonna have a lot of 19 firm, 19 employer firms. Um, or I'm gonna have lots of part-time work because if they don't work a certain number of hours then I'm not required to give them benefits, for example. That, however, is a demand story, right? That's not a supply story. And, we, I, and I, the literature kind of argues that job lock, however, is a supply story because now that I have portability of my health insurance, I don't have to supply my labor to a specific firm. I can then move to another firm. And, the, and again, and the nice part about what we're gonna do here with these, uh, these army data is we're gonna be able to separate out the demand shock from the supply shock. And so we can make sure that we are identifying job lock per se. Again, job lock, and if you think about it in the traditional diamond mod search model from labor economics, right, that search is very costly. There's these switching costs from moving from jobs to jobs. So Peter Diamond argues in his Nobel Prize winning paper that maybe unemployment benefit can be beneficial for the worker because it buys that worker time to search to find the right match, right? So the other side of this argument is with the Affordable Care Act dependency mandate, uh, I'm going to be able to have portability of health insurance and that essentially lowers my opportunity cost of search. So again, uh, job lock, we said the supply side because it increases wages from other jobs. We talked about diamond. Diamond agrees, argues that this friction is because the churn allows people to sort into better jobs or better match. Um, Similarly, workers in a bad match could afford to search for the health because healthcare becomes more portable, and the firm's fi the firm, however, is going to face higher turnover. And we find this for the army as well. One potential problem that the army has is the army can't go out and hire a middle manager to come in and take over, right? So if I have what's commonly called like an E7, 
sergeant first class. This is someone that's been in the Army 10 to 15 years. If that sergeant first class moves, it's not like in academia where if one of my associate professors moves to another institution, I put a, a, a on the Joe, I recruit another associate professor to take his spot. If a sergeant first class moves, I have to recruit an, an E1 or a private to come in at the bottom, take 10 years to train him up so that, to replace that sergeant first class. So this portability is going to come at the expense of the Army and maybe some national security concerns. It could be one of the trade-offs. However, we can also then make this argument that Diamond makes that while maybe the Army or the firm in this case might lose, the individual who maybe sees a better opportunity than being in the Army and being able to move would gain higher utility from that move, maybe higher, higher uh, wages and lifetime earnings because of that move. So it becomes this kind of nuanced loss to the Army but gain to these veterans. Okay. So kind of Brandy alluded to this, there's a few problems that we have when we're trying to look at job lock. And job lock is very hard to measure in traditional labor data because of a number of issues. The first big issue is if I have like the American Community Survey or the current population uh, study that you usually traditionally use to answer this question, I, I, it's either unobserved or there's great heterogeneity in wages and benefits, right? So some of these workers might not have great health insurance to begin with. Some of these workers might have excellent health insurance. So is it really that they're locked be, or maybe they're, they're paid really well? So I have this heterogeneity and it's many cases unobservable to the econometrician. And so all those issues are being put into the error term. We have great endogeneity issues here. Uh, second problem is, is there's endogeneity in timing for leaving the firm, right? So academia might be a little bit more similar to the army than other jobs, right? Because if I'm just working at a, you know, a manufacturing plant and I decide I want to quit and go to another job, I can go in at any time, maybe submit my two weeks notice and then take off after those two weeks, right? Uh, the Army doesn't have that problem because when I enlist to the Army, I negotiate a three to five year term of contract. And so essentially my file, or you could say like my forehead as a soldier, is stamped with this expiration date. And so then at that, uh, that date that's exogenously chosen, I have to make a decision to leave or not. In normal labor market data, there's two problems. Is one, I could be leaving for something totally endogenous to the treatment effect, or I, there could be something unobserved that's motivating me to leave. Uh, then finally, one difficulty in some of these papers is it's unclear, again, whether it's a demand shock or supply shock. So some, some of these data sets, I see someone leave their job and I'm not sure if that's because they were terminated or laid off or because they're choosing to leave, right? A, a firing or a termination would be a demand shock to their labor while choosing to leave would be a supply shock to their labor. So I want to understand why this, why I, I, I understand there's endogeneity and timing of sure. when I mean, that's why you look for some exogenous shock, right? right. It's going to, some policy shock that's going to change. Why is that harder to measure in traditional labor data versus what you're looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with uh, the nice thing about what we're going to do here that maybe makes it cleaner. Like I'm not arguing that maybe some of the previous estimates are wrong. But what makes it clean here is that there, I, before the treatment is hit or, or the bill is passed, three years before I am locking into a three-year contract with a given exo exogenous date where I have to make this decision. And so that, that decision date is going to be orthogonal to the, treatment, to the policy change. Exactly. Unless you're dumped, right? What's that? Unless you're court martialed. That's right. That's right. And we're going to get rid of those guys. And, and that's coded, that's flagged in my data. I can get rid of those guys. And we'll talk about that. Because the other problem you could say with this is this is also happening around a time where we have a drawdown, right? Mm -hmm. We're pulling out of Iraq and Afghanistan-ish, I should say, right? And, and so you could say, oh yeah, all these people aren't really job locked. They're getting told, thanks for your service, go do something else because we don't need you anymore. All that stuff is flagged in my data because before you can choose whether or not to leave the Army, the Army comes to you and says, hey, you've been a great employee, we're going to offer you re-enlistment. And that's coded, and so I'm only going to consider soldiers who are offered this re-enlistment. 
So the drawdown or any of these other confounders is not really a concern, at least here. The drawdown takes place with fewer offers of reenlistment? That's right. Yeah. And how, what percentage of people don't finish their three-year contract because they go AWOL? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be really small, right? And those guys are going to show up in Leavenworth, right? In prison, right? Because that would be a crime going AWOL in this case. I only meant that how many people don't finish because... 95% of contracts are completed, or is there is other ways to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think these data that I have, the data that was given to me in this data set are people who finish. Yeah. So I don't have anyone from the get-go that I can say, oh, these people are serving time in Leavenworth, right? But that would be a really good question to put well, in they're, here. They're just dishonorably discharged, or they... Right. Yeah. Something else happens based on. Yeah, I mean, a dishonorable insurance usually kind of comes into accordance with this not being offered reenlistment, right? It's like you've been a problem, we pull your file, it turns out you had X number of infractions, you have bad ratings by your superiors, and so thank you, but no thank you, right? So those folks we're going to take out of the data because that's more of a demand shock. And do you have any sort of controls in place for um, casualties for the military? Do they yeah, casualties aren't going to be in here, right? So, so you're not being job locked by being killed, right? Or job unlocked, yeah. Yeah, not in these data. No, no, no. Because ca casualties would have been flagged and we took care of those. We also took care of, uh, or took care of, that's not the right phrase to use here. We also dropped uh, disabled veterans. So maybe my convoy is attacked or runs over an IED and now I, I'm disabled, we've coded those and we've dropped them from the subsample we're gonna use here. Because you could think of that almost kind of like a demand shock, right? Like if I'm that severely injured, then uh, that the, the army doesn't need my labor. And that sounds kind of harsh, but that's how an economist would think about it, right? So what kind of disability rating cutoff you sort of use? Uh, so they're coded up as people who are left because they were med or medical boarded out and because they were disabled. And so they're just coded up as disabled. They're not off for re-enlistment, right? And, and I, I know you we talk about a lot in this paper about sort of heterogeneous, uh, you know, treatment effects who sure. are the margin, and that, and that seems particularly important in, in this context, right? Right. Because we're talking about producing a, a public good and that, right. of national defense, and mm -hmm. thinking about what is sort of the optimal labor selection to to, to, to generate that, and it's important to aim the optimal drawdown. Right. 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 Say. So, thinking about how this policy shock is affecting the types of folks who sort of stay around at at, at, at at times when they when the at times when the demand for for, for 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 services is changing because of a world event. Right. No, exactly. And so uh, OEMA, which we'll talk a little bit more about that Joseph familiar with, is driven by this idea of talent management, right? Because we have this up and out system. Uh, as you are very, very talented in the army and there's uniform pay, I might decide to take like LeBron James, take my talent elsewhere, right? And so what the Army is really worried about is having negative selection as this goes on. And what I will show you is that this effect affects higher human capital soldiers at a greater rate. And so that means that the Army is probably going to be bleeding more talent because of the portability of health insurance, which, which is a big issue for the Army, but also the reason why we test this, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, as Brandy and I kind of discussed in our office hour was, one of the difficulties in identifying using the dependent mandate is for it to be binding, you have to be a, a young adult whose parents have health insurance to begin with, right? And so while, like all the other papers, I don't get to see whether the soldier's parents have health insurance, but for example, I do get to see whether the, the soldier has a college degree. And college degree soldiers, we would assume, probably come from families that have higher health insurance at a higher rate. Also, it tends to be higher income families that we see the effect bigger at. And so I can't clearly say, yes, I can see the soul, I can't observe the parents, but it, it, it goes into accordance with who I would expect parents to have health insurance. Which then it gives us a big question too, are we having negative selection out of the army here? So that's great. And we've kind of already talked about Army data solves all these issues. So the first one is conditional on rank and what's called branch or occupation lane within the Army. A second lieutenant is going to get paid second lieutenant pay. If you are an awesome second lieutenant or captain, 
where I guess these folks are enlisted. So if you're an awesome uh, specialist or sergeant, you're going to get paid the same as the person within rank, right? This is where the saying, it's above my pay grade comes from, because there are these very specific pay grades in the military, and a job that's above your pay grade means that you have to go up a rank to be able to do that, right? So, and the nice thing is, is these soldiers are being covered by TRICARE. So uh, when we talk about socialized medicine, my colleagues in uniform like to say, I live with socialized medicine, right? So they have zero healthcare costs, 100% coverage, which is really nice because then I don't have this heterogeneity. Did these soldiers have, did these workers have health insurance to begin with? I know everyone in my sample is being covered by TRICARE. And when I put rank and branch controls in, I know they're all getting paid the same. What's the likelihood of being offered or being enlistment in your sample? Yeah, so the offer of being, in my sample, it's about a 75% are offered re-enlistment. I wonder if it would be interesting to look at sort of people on their initial contract uh -huh. with your data, yep. um, because then you might have kind of more of a mix of good and bad matches, whereas those people who yeah, we've thought about this and we're trying to get the, we're, that's one of those next steps and I think that's a really good idea because that's when you would find out if the army is right for you, right? And if we have a lot of people who have been in, if maybe my control group has too many like second or third enlistment people, then maybe they have signaled that they're willing to stay in no matter what. And so. Uh, I believe we ran that. I'm going to double check, and the results were robust. But I definitely, that's definitely a great next step to show that we're cleanly, even more cleanly identifying an effect. So, thank you. The, the tough part is, is these are older enlisted soldiers, right? So your stereotypical. I'll show you a little bit more about the Army rank structure. We're not having your stereotypical kind of private that you see in the movies, 18 year old kind of. These guys are what we would call non-commissioned officers or NCOs and they're kind of like the lower middle management kind of group. So, okay. Which is important too because that increases the cost, right? If we're just losing a lot of privates, the Army's like, we can churn out privates like crazy, right? When we're losing some more of your more seasoned soldiers, that's a big cost to the DOD. But nobody's in jail in their first. Oh, no, 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 no. These are all people who've been in the. So I'm going to show you most of the folks in my SAM sample are junior NCOs. So meaning they've been in 10 years? Uh, perhaps, but not quite. So maybe they have either a longer re enlistment, so you can go up to a five year re enlistment. So that could be the case here. Or what they could have done is join the Army later. So not everyone's joining the Army at 18. But nobody joins the Army as an NCO. No. So nobody's on their first. Well, we'll, we'll I'll show you some of the rank, and you can see the distribution amongst the rank, yeah. It doesn't take long to move from E1 to E2. Okay. It's just like a three, four month period. Uh, so we have, uh, we have a lot of E3s, which are like not quite NCOs, and then E4, E5s, which are like newbie NCOs. And they've maybe been in like, they could either be on the start of their, their, they're finishing a second enlistment or they could be have done a longer enlistment, a, a longer first enlistment. What's most important here is that because of the bandwidth of years we selected, all of these people have at least made that re-enlistment decision if they're on their second re-enlistment before the Affordable Care Act was even conceived. So then it's not like I'm like seeing the Affordable Care Act, re-enlisting and then popping up again in the data. So. And no, nobody can be we do not have to be concerned that anybody joined the Army before the Affordable Care Act, anticipating what would That's right, that's right. No flooding impossible. Right, right, right. No, exactly. Like, like, by construct, right? There's none of this, like, I'm going to get into the Army because I heard that Obamacare was going to kill all our health insurance because I listened to Fox News and I want TRICARE, right? <laughs> so, like, that, that, which could be a conceivable story in other data sets, but in this data set, that enlistment contract was made way before the ACA was even conceived, so we don't have to worry about that threat to identification. But that's a great point. All right. Okay, so what are we doing then? So we're going to exploit this natural experiment, the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And it's one piece, right? So I heard uh, David Bradford uh, 
at UGA once said in our health economist class, and you probably know David, said that the Affordable Care Act was going to be the health economist uh, employment act, right? <laughs> because there were so many parts to it, so many natural experience built. I mean, Jonathan Gruber was thinking about his, you know, <laughs> his graduate students when he wrote this act up. And so, so it's really hard when, like, I, I love it on when I sit on airplanes and people are like, what do you think about Obamacare? And my retort back's like, which piece would you like to talk about? And then usually the conversation stops, right? Or when I was in my health econ class, I had a push poll that called and said, tell us if you favor the, the, the evil Obamacare. And I told the pollster, I'm like, which part would you like me to talk about? And they're, they're, they were just confused. So the, the part. I saw the pamphlet that they were handing out at CVS that said, the title of it was Affordable Care Act Answers. Oh, right. <laughs> I think I said the people are still looking. Yeah, no, I mean. But CBS solved it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it, you can tell a health economist, you can see their fingerprints all over this law, right? So there's cutoffs and, and, and discontinuities and all sorts of fun stuff, which almost makes me want to get out of education, but not quite, <laughs> Joe. So I'll just dabble. So. <laughs> But what the, this act is, if, the part, if, if, if you're familiar with it, is young adults under the age of 26 were allowed to go back on their parents' health insurance at no extra cost if the parents already had like a family plan, right? So most of you are familiar with health insurance, but usually have a single, a single plus one, and then a single plus one plus children, right? And so you're able to be added. And so I was in graduate school at this time. I was 24. My wife was 24. And so we're like, awesome. We'll go back on our parents' health insurance, which my dad was like, as long as you're paying your own rent and there's no additional cost to me, <laughs> you can go back on the health insurance. So, uh, so what we're going to do is it's a difference in differences routine. We're going to have the treated group be soldiers 23 to 25 because we want to kind of avoid that 26 year because it's the cutoff. And we're following some other papers that have done this as well. And then we want to look at soldiers that are 27 to 29 as our control group. And we'll go a bit more into it. Given the uniqueness of the Army labor market, which I've made this argument, we're going to identify a, a cleanish, I guess. There's no perfectly clean estimate. But we, we kind of argue that why should we care about the Army? Because it gives us a cleaner estimate than other data sets. Uh, a measure of job lock for soldiers using that difference in differences estimator. And if, and if you have to leave for class or you fall asleep or, or, or something breaks down, uh, Spoiler alert, right? Uh, the dependency mandate reduced reenlistment by 2.7 percentage points or 5.5% of reenlistments. And we back that out to be around about 10,000 soldiers, which is, which is quite a bit. Because our base here is about when conditional on being offered reenlistment, about 50% take it up. All right, so again, a bit on the Affordable Care Act. This at least part. Uh, first, it's kind of, it's a nice clean experiment because it was uncertain whether or not it was going to pass, right? So it was, went through uh, re reconciliation and all these kind of legislative uh, actions. The, the nice part, again, the dependency mandate required people to cover their children until they were 26. And what's most important also for identification here is it went into effect immediately, right? So it wasn't like other aspects like Medicaid expansion or the health exchanges where they said, hey, this is coming down the pipe and you have till 2014 to figure it out. Because then you would worry about some kind of like, if you're a macro person, some kind of like rational expectations or behavior responses. But this happened the second it was passed, this went into effect. Also, it seems to be the least controversial aspect of the Affordable Care Act. Like, Nobody has taken to the streets or protested or, you know, uh, try, they haven't even really talked about repealing it with all the different bills. And so it wasn't included in part of this uh, Supreme Court case that happened in 2012, which is nice, too, because we would worry about uh, maybe soldiers saying, you know, what, I don't want I want to go ahead and reenlist because I'm not sure if this benefit will be available to me. Right. So it just never has been controversial. There haven't really been any threats to get rid of it. So, Dicey, did you have a question? I'm sorry. OK, I thought, OK. Uh, and it, there are previous state mandates that had this provision. So uh, my colleague Briggs DePew at Utah State has a, has a Journal of Health Economics paper that looks at the state mandate. So individual states had diff varying ages that cut you off from your parents' health insurance. Um, Illinois actually 
was one state that allowed if you were a veteran you could go on your and you were out processing out of the military you could go on your parents health insurance till 24. so that's and we drop and include illinois i don't show you that table and it doesn't seem to matter though some of the states also was like either a wholesale right you could just stay on your parents no matter what happened some states said well, you could only stay on your parents' health insurance if you were going, calling to college, uh, some college or job that had certain requirements so that they, what, some, some state governments were worried about that displacing private health insurance, right? Could, could you do that like in the, in the Army data, right? Look at where they're, they're you got they Yeah, we have home of record. Yeah, yeah, and we put home of record fixed effects in there. And then since Illinois has this weird one, we wouldn't want it all driven by Illinois in some kind of pre-trend. So, so we just drop it and include it, and it makes really no difference. No, I just meant looking at those particular state mandates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you saw oh, yeah, before, before? Yeah, yeah, whether you saw a pattern that was similar to your ACA effect. Oh, uh, that's uh, true, yeah. For those state policy shops. Because you, you've got, right, you, you have where they... We have their home of record. Okay. Yeah, and so that's always the interesting thing working with Army data is there's really two states you want to think about, right? There's the where they're from, and then when they're getting out. So there's three, actually. They're where they're from. If they decide to get out, where are they located, right? Are they at Fort Benning in Georgia, but they're from California? And then, the, and then the also they pull them, like, where are you planning on going, right? And so that could... Illinois could mess us up conceivably because I'm going to drop out and go on my parents' health insurance and move to Chicago just because I can, right? And so that's why we, we throw in those controls and those fix effects and do some robustness checks on that. So, But that's a good point. Maybe we could find a, a similar effect amongst those states as they turn on and off. Maybe that becomes a second paper, right? So. All right, and then some of the previous papers that we'll talk about why are we hope to fit in this literature the first one on job lock obviously before the ACA but the classic job lock paper is Bridget Madrian's 1993 QGAE because of some of this exo or endogeneity that we were talking about variation of benefits health concerns that was one I forgot to say some people are concerned that maybe I have a pre-existing condition and the results are being driven by unhealthy people in the treatment and control group that's kind of ruining or not ruining but like causing it to not truly be a treatment group the nice thing about army data is there's very strict health requirements right you have to have height weight can't have certain diseases can't have certain uh, problems and so then those people are not in our data set so these are all people that are hitting the health standards and so I'm not worried about an adverse selection problem so uh, but Bridget Madrian one way you could get around this in some previous literature is you don't look at the worker, but you look at the worker's spouse. So if the worker's spouse, uh, if, the, if the worker has health insurance, does that affect how the worker's spouse moves from job to job, right? Because that essentially becomes uh, a release of the job lock there. And so she finds that uh, spouses of workers that are full-time that already have generous health benefits tend to move job to job more often than not. You'd worry about maybe some self-selection there of the worker. Maybe there's a joint decision being made between the worker and their spouse to accept certain jobs that would then free the spouse to have more portability. Uh, the first paper that looked the same, used the same identification that we had was this Antwi et al. 2013 AG, AJ policy paper. They looked at the American uh, Community Survey and they found that um, they did the same thing. The dependent variable was take up of the health, parents' health insurance. And they found that pre post uh, ACA, also with 23 to 25 year olds, were more likely to go on their parents' health insurance when this passed. Uh, there was some criticism of that paper that we'll discuss, and that we used some ro uh, robustness checks to get around those criticisms. So they worry about if you expand your years out enough then you have, you could just pick up anything is one criticism of this paper that uh, Slusky showed. And then also uh, you might just be picking up uh, adverse selection, sicker people going on. Uh, again, Briggs DePew shows that uh, in states that had this before the Affordable Care Act, it lowered hours of work. So it's not necessarily a job lock story, but it's a, uh, an intensive margin story, while ours is going to be an extensive margin, do I leave my job? As well as Barbaresco et al. found a similar thing. 
Uh, DePue and Bailey show that the mandate led to 2.5 to 2.8 percent increase in premiums for health family plans. So uh, while you could, you, the marginal child is a zero, right, to add that extra child on, they found that moving from uh, a worker plus one plan to a, fam a full family plan increased as well. The demand for these plans increased. Uh, and then a nice JHR paper that kind of actually inspired this paper, this was the first one I saw come through, was Abraham Witz and the JHR show the dependency mandate reduced marriage rates and increased cohabitation, which was kind of a neat, neat result, right? Now that I don't depend on the person I'm dating to, for my health insurance, then I'm less likely to marry that person and more likely to actually leave those relationships. So it's not a job lock, but rather a marriage lock story, I guess you could say. And a good catchy title saying, I don't, is the title of the paper, right? So my, my, uh, my co-author suggested we should call ours uh, Job Lock and Unloaded. But, <laughs> but I'm like, well, let, let's see how this paper develops before we go for the nifty title. So. Does that paper talk about uh, European countries where marriage rates have plummeted, birth rates have plummeted. Right, right. Their sort of universal health care. Yeah, no, that paper doesn't touch on that. That would be really interesting, right? Whether universal health care turning on and off. Countries get really hard after a while, like inner country stuff, because there's also culture that you're trying to, and did the culture rate, like, this is what we were talking to some of the grad students when you look at like state liquor laws, right? Like, like my home state drinks very little alcohol and they also have high liquor laws. So you might be tempted to say the liquor laws preventing Utahns from drinking and that's probably, it's probably the reverse causality is going on, right? And so when you look at like over country comparisons, sometimes this is difficult in a similar way. But they looked at just the United States with this different diff, but that's a really interesting idea. I can't remember if they do fertility in this paper or not, but that would be an interesting, maybe give it five years, right? To see if it also reduced, uh, Fertility. There's a forthcoming paper on that. Oh, is there? Yeah, Chrisley Simon and uh, Oh, okay. Nice. And did they find a reduce a reduction in fertility from it, or was it? Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'll have, I'll have to look it up. Go either way because childbirth is really expensive. No, that's that's true. Or maybe now that. The increase went up. the 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 benefit for having family, I don't know. No, that's really. Right, right. Because it reduces the cost, but yet, if your fertility is hooked to your job, and then that causes, if you're a woman and you have a baby and you can't work, it may or may not. Right. So. Uh, and then this. Oh, this paper, uh, Bailey and, uh, and Crony show that uh, 2016 comparative economic policy, they find no effect of the AC on job lock. However, they're using the, com the current population study, which suffers from some of the other things we've talked about, the problems there. So, All right, so we kind of brushed on this a little bit, but why do we care? Within the Army, because whenever I... It, it's amazing how even spending three years kind of in total immersion program you start to speak army and not English, right? And so it's fun to kind of talk about this weird organization I kind of work for. So again, one of the big questions we have is how do we attract and retain the best talent? Uh, this has been called Ash Carter, the former defense secretary was calling it force of the future. So he was proposing like, hey, if a business leader wants to come in and become a mid-range manager, why can't we just make a very talented business major a, a major? on arrival. Uh, like for example, they only allow you to do that for lawyers and doctors. So when I arrived, one of my colleagues was like, hey, why don't you just join the army and you could be in the army half of our institution. And I looked it up and with an econ PhD doesn't qualify for that. So I'd have to start as a second lieutenant making like $30,000 and go rush off to Fort Benning and drive tanks before I could do econ ever again, right? So that's one question that Ash Carter said is, are we losing talented people with very specific jobs because they can't, they would have to leave their mid-range job and start at the bottom. Or, or maybe if a captain wants to go work on Wall Street, if he quit, that'd be it for him. So maybe we put a pause on his army career, go let him work two years at Wall Street learn something from Wall Street, come back to the Army and turn it on again. So a lot of these ideas are being pushed around right now. And, and Secretary Mattis seems quasi-supportive of investigating these ideas. 
Uh, so again, we have these term week contracts. We're no, there's no two week notice in the army, right? <laughs> if you are an E2 private and you're like, man, I really don't want to deploy, that, that, that's not really an option for you, right? You signed up for three years and you do what you're told for three years. You don't issue a two week, you're not in Iraq in a Humvee and you're like, oh, two week notice, I get to go home now, right? That doesn't happen here. So that, that helps with some of that endogeneity of leaving. Uh, branches again, so branches is also known as occupation lanes. I have a forthcoming JHR that goes over this branch stuff. Um, soldiers are, are, they're put into a branch. When you're enlisted, you pick one of these branches. So maybe I want to be a helicopter mechanic. So that means I branch aviation. And then it's very, very difficult to change branches. So even within the army, there's these 16 kind of mini bureaucracies and it's, you can't really move from lane to lane. Some of them like um, med services and aviators, like helicopter pilots, have flight pay or bonus pay to retain talented nurses and whatnot or, or doctors. Uh, but we're gonna put in these branch fixed effects so that should net some of that out. So within the job, your pay is the same. So an infantry uh, sergeant is an infantry sergeant in the view, eyes of the army for compensation. And then the zero lateral entry. Army cannot recruit civilians to come be a sergeant's role. And if sergeant leaves, they gotta start, we gotta start recruits at the bottom as a private. So I kind of built this in, especially because I knew I was talking to master's students a little bit, and then how also really helpful for me, this was really good. Uh, I told Joe when I found out this was going to be kind of a graduate student slash faculty crowd, I watched the video of the last one, so I kind of, and it was helpful for me, I wrote down like, what are, what do I need to be true, right? And I think this is really helpful exercise, is like, if I could run the perfect world for this research study, what would I want to be true, right? So number one, I would want the wage and benefit structures to be identical between treatment and control. I would want the health of these workers to be identical. I don't want pre-existing conditions and adverse selection driving my, my result. I want that time and stay decision to be exogenous. Workers leave the firm because they want to, not because they're being shown the door. And I want the parallel trends assumption to hold, right? I want my pre-trends to look, they don't have to be identical, but I'm gonna show you a really cool graph that we were really excited about. When my, uh, when my cadet showed me that he had graphed this graph, I redid the graph three times because I couldn't believe it. And he's like, diff and diff is easy. And I'm like, no dude, no, 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 no. Like, you struck a gold mine, so. But I'm gonna show you some pre-trends because we, we don't necessarily need overlapping trends. They don't need to be identical in difference and differences. However, they need to be moving in the same direction before the launch. What's cool for me is they are identical, pre-trend wise. So, again, we, we have uniform pay, health standards, contracts, limited endogeneity, and there's answers to your question. So 75% are offered this re-enlistment or not. And then we drop those guys because I don't know why they weren't offered re-enlistment and that would not be good for my identification to have them in there. Because mechanically we just see a dip, right? All right, and I'll show you my parallel trend sign. So just careful, we, we use the data from Office of Economic and Manpower Analysis hosted at West Point, which I'm very grateful that they were willing to let me have it. Uh, what, what this is, this data center is, is every month the Army sends us or the data center a snapshot of every soldier and their characteristics and this includes grades, AFQT scores, education previous to being in the army, their health, uh, so I can see like height, weight, two mile run, push up sit ups, so in some cases, I know I have that for cadets definitely which is kind of cool. Uh, effectiveness on ratings, so where they ranked we, the Army has this interesting one. It's kind of like A, B, and C, like you would grade a student. So you think of a distribution. It's, it's nice to teach distributions to, to cadets because they they have this rating scheme called above center of mass, at center of mass, or center of mass, and below center of mass. So they kind of get this distribution idea, right? And especially if you're an officer that wants to go very, very far up the ranks, you want to hit as many above center of masses as possible. 
and then you're rated amongst people within your unit. So, so for example, at West Point, we pick some of the very best, and that becomes some interesting office politics because the distribution is way over here, but the mass is not the army, but rather the unit that you're in. So, and across some of these different points, I, I mean, I imagine a lot of them are going to be consistent for a soldier. You know, their pre-existing education is going to be that's right consistent at every measurement. Are there any trends within those ones that may be updating monthly that you? Could control for or see if there's some other underlying things. So duty know. stations would change, right? Yes. Spouses would change and dependents would change. Or, Maybe like grades and scores. Yeah, so this isn't a panel data set. This is just what we have stored. So I'm just using a cross section. I just want to see the guys that are up for up for reenlistment within a certain bandwidth of the ACA. Because I don't want to go way back, because who knows what happened down there that could confound. And I don't have a whole lot to go forward, right? Because it was passed in 2010. So uh, one idea that we've had that we want to try as a next step is almost like laying a regression discontinuity. This was Dave Lyle's comment. Because I can see the date that they expired. They are expired like month, date, and year. And so you can almost see like how close to that passage or not to try to get a really clean effect. But we see everything about, we see a lot about their spouses, and then we get to see whether or not they had a child at a certain date, and really kind of cool. My uh, colleague, uh, Susan Carter, is working with Abby Wozniak at Notre Dame, looking at moves, because moves are exogenous, conditional on certain things, and how moves affect uh, divorce rates, because you can see when they divorce in the Army, and deployments, and things like that, and deployments, so. And, and as a group, we're working on merging so we have some cool merges with Treasury in the works, Census in the works, uh, National Clearing House, Credit Bureaus, Veterans Affairs, etc. cetera. Uh, we see them in the Army. Our issue is when they leave the Army. And so that's why we're working with these different groups to get a better picture of what happens afterwards, which we'll talk a little bit about in this talk here, for one. And we're using a subsample of soldiers. We, we, we do have some privates in here that have started a little bit later. And private is E1 to E3, uh, up to sergeant, which is E5. So we have no senior, we don't have any like sergeant first classes or anything like that. Uh, so we don't have any senior, senior non-commissioned officers that were offered. And we only look at those that were offered reenlistment. And data is from 07 to 13. So here's some of my summary stats. It kind of gets at your question here. Uh, reenlisted about half. Conditional on being offered, about half take it up and go for another another three or five years. You can see the distribution. We don't have any E1s, but E1 doesn't take very long to move from E1 to E2. Uh, most of our mass is here, kind of in the um, specialist uh, range, so E4, which is still pretty junior. You're no longer a private, which is the top. E1 to E3s are considered privates, but you're still kind of you're starting to kind of peak up with age. Which, it's not inconceivable on a first uh, enlistment to make it to E4. So, which, which kind of makes sense in our mass here. Average age is 24 because we're only considering people between that 23 to uh, 27 range. 67% are white, 15 are black, 87% are male, right? So, uh, I think the office, this is represented the enlisted core. The, the officer corps is much more white and a little bit more female. Uh, our education, 13 have, you have to graduate from high school. To join the military. You, can't, you can't drop out of high school to join the military. But you can see that 74% only have a high school diploma. However, we do some, see some, some college, some college grads. Uh, the zero for graduate degree is, uh, is a rounding error. There aren't like zero, precisely zero. So, um, for example, there are some jobs that require a graduate education, but because of the way they're coded, you can't be an officer to do that job. So I have friends in the West Point Band, and one of my close friends is a percussionist in the West Point Band, and he has a master's in music, but the only officer job is the conductor of the band, right? So, so you do see some graduate degrees. Ever married? 50% have ever been married in this group, and number of dependents, 0.96. So I don't know where the 0.04 of that child went, but 0.96 <laughs> dependence on average. So half, half married women, 
teenagers only 25. Yeah, there's some interesting incentives. It's a very different population. They're coming mostly enlisted or coming from low income backgrounds. Uh, I'm not on these papers, but there is some very interesting things. For example, if, if you are a brand new private and you're single, you have to live in the barracks. Mm -hmm. And also, if you are married and have dependents, your housing allowance goes up, as does your salary. So it's a bunch of built in incentives. For that's right. And so that's, so. That, there are some concerns about that. Yeah. And all of it's anecdotal, right? There's not an awesome paper. We should wait for a good natural experiment. We can write that paper, Joe, right? But, so, but I did sit through a briefing once at the Westerns where they were looking at restructuring the housing to try to alleviate some of those incentives. So. And then the number of observations I have in my subsamples, 146,000 soldiers. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, you have, a, you have someone who has 10 dependents. I just find that yeah. to be kind of extreme. I, I, I think that is extreme. Uh, I know some folks that are approaching that, that are foster families and whatnot. I should probably look to see how many are 10 and maybe drop them, but I doubt 10 is I just was gonna a mode. It's a very high max. But I should check that. Yep. Not even one. It's a standard DVD. Yeah, you probably just have one very stressed out household, <laughs> given I have three little kids, right, so. Sure. Cool. All right, so we're going to, like I said, we're going to use this difference in difference strategy proposed by uh, Antwi and other papers such as Briggs de Pew's and Joel Abramitz. We're going to consider soldiers aged 23 to 25, like the rest of the literature does, as our treatment group. 27 to 29 is our control. The second difference is pre-post policy. So I, I tell people uh, I'm not smart enough to do more advanced econometrics than this, right? So that's why I have to rely on natural experiments. So the econometrics is really nice and straightforward. Um, we're going to see this re-enlistment exp expiration date. So we're going to sort out those who were in the pre and post group before March 23rd, 2010. One of the difficulties in the ACS and the CPS is what do you do if you're 2010, right? Because the bill was passed on March 23rd, so they drop that sometimes that year 2010. Nice part about me is I see when they're, the date their contracts expire, so I can code them even more fine down to when the passage, yes or no. And again, this, this policy is up in the air and nobody knows when it's gonna pass, which is really nice. And our identification strategy rests on parallel trends holding. So here's the graph that everyone wants to see in a solid diff and diff paper. Uh, the blue line is my treatment group. The orange line is my control group. And what I really enjoy about this paper, 2010 is obviously the day the policy is passed. They're almost overlapping trends. And then when after the policy is passed, we see a nice dip. And then it even still runs parallel just at a lower rate which again, I, I redid that many times to make sure that was right. And now I have a very cocky second lieutenant who thinks that difference in differences is this easy. So uh, the other thing we'd want to see is covariate balance. And so here is a covariant balance table. Uh, one thing that I always like to see in a difference in difference paper is I want, I always like to see when the author kind of does the difference in differences outside the regression. And so you can see here, Here's pre-ACA for my control group, and it nets out to zero, essentially. I mean, it's a little bit rounding error because I'm down to two digits. I should probably expand this out a little bit more. But here you can see that 0.03, and then we pretty much calculate what we find in the regression, which is awesome. Age, obviously, we're going to see some kind of difference, but by con or no difference because of construct, right? Uh, we do see a little bit movement here, like obviously number of dependents is a little bit higher in our control group because they're older. Um, I don't have married in here for some reason, but married is higher as a covariate because they're older. And so we want to include the covariates to make sure we're robust. But like, for example, male pretty much nets out and is across the board that way. Uh, race is about balanced across those boards. So. We were, again, very excited when we ran this table as well. I don't know if there's any reason to think that reenlistment offers would change around the time of the ACA, but did you 
look at the enlistment offers. You know, that's really, I, you know, we didn't do that, and we should do that, just to make sure. I mean, you can, you would assume, even though we conditioned on re-enlistment, that maybe some of this dip might be due to other confounding factors, right? The nice thing is, for example, we have the post-9-11 GI Bill that's being introduced around this time. And this is going to be why we do this placebo test. But the nice thing for the post-9-11 GI Bill in our favor is that's going to affect everyone in my sample, right? It's not just affecting people 26 and under. And so we're going to do some placebo tests to make sure that's true, or a drawdown, right? So we're going to pull out of Iraq and Afghanistan. It's not like the Pentagon saying, and we're going to draw down under 26-year-olds more than over 26-year-olds. And so while there are, there's lots going on, I mean, this is a very tumultuous period, both in domestic policy and international policy. But what we feel really good about is that break of 26 is pretty arbitrary for the Pentagon, right? I mean, it's big in health insurance, but it's not like the Pentagon's thinking age 26 around. And we have these nice parallel trends afterwards that's showing that if we have those co-founders, it's affecting the treatment and control group equally. And so that's why we have this nice parallel movement, but albeit at a lower rate. So these are reenlistment rates, meaning you've been offered reenlistment. That's right. Uh, this is the drawdown period then, where the reenlistment rates in both groups are declining. Mm -hmm. If you're drawing down, you're offering reenlistment to fewer. That's right. So this is these are people that this graph is conditional on being offered. That's right. right. Okay. How would reenlistment rates be affected by a drawdown? So if you're drawing down, you tightened up how many uh, soldiers you offer reenlistment yep. to, presumably that means fewer marginal matches or you're offering... So what you would be concerned, believe it or not, um, I don't think I'd ever say this if I was running for Congress, so this YouTube video will kill my political career, right? But a lot of soldiers like to deploy. They get bonuses, they get tax benefits, uh, and some don't, but some do like to deploy. And I, you know, that's always a big question at, the, at West Point. You'll hear a lot of scuttlebutt with cadets like, hey, if we're not going to fight any wars anymore, if we're pulling out of Iraq and Afghanistan, does that mean I don't get my chance, right? And so you could maybe say, and I'm not saying that this is it, but there could be a story like we would see a dip even on offering reenlistment if there's a drawdown because I might either not get to go again and I wonder, is it worth staying in? Or I might be afraid that the, even though the drawdown's not affecting me this time, it might affect me next time. And will I be working in a hollowed out army that's not deploying anymore? Those seem like second, second order explanations to this. Sure. Would you, have been, would you have fully expected to see the reenlistment rates falling at the same time that the reenlistment offers were falling? Mm -hmm. or, Right? I mean, I yeah, yeah, and that's where I'm. That's what I'm kind of get at. Reenlistment offers are falling because of this drawdown. Yeah. So I'm wondering about my quality of life and my career, given that the army's drawing what down. Mean, right. What you're doing is, is moving up the, the pay line. Sure. Uh, so to speak, and, and maybe a bunch of marginal soldiers that would get offered reenlistment when you're growing the army now don't. Right. The group that's left are they are they actually less likely to accept reenlistment maybe because they're higher human capital type mm -hmm. when they have scores in the army they've got better opportunities elsewhere whereas when you offer it to those marginal soldiers they're like Whew. yeah <laughs> made it through yeah 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 no that's a really good question we'll have to think a bit more about that then. i mean that's the kind of story i think on the fly but that will be something maybe to think about try to test right why uh, is the uh, afqt score higher for the older group yeah, so that could be a positive selection problem, right? So maybe this older group, and this is why I think it's good to maybe we'll go back and try to re control on that first enlistment, right? The older group might have, already, the herd might have been called a little bit. Because they're all people who had to re-enlist at least once, Chris, they proved to be good soldiers, which probably is correlated with them having... Right, right, right. Or, or, or what happens is people who have higher AFQT scores are more likely to get the job that they want upon re-enlistment. If, if we want to say it's a first enlistment story, and maybe those people that are older have more maturity and bump it up. But that's a good question. Wait a minute, you're identifying the, the older group as the second re-enlistment, it's not necessarily. It's not necessarily, but on average it is. Not necessarily, yeah. 
So that's why I think a good robustness check that was pointed out is looking at first enlistment only, second enlistment only. I wonder if you also included in the age that they were when they had first enlisted. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, just the story that I'm thinking, let's say you have two people that are on their second enlistment right, making that decision. One joined real early, one joined a little bit older. The one that joined earlier maybe wasn't as mature, maybe the army wasn't as good of a fit. And so yeah. naturally that's kind of introducing this. I mean, it probably washes out because of those parallel trends. But. Right, right. No, that's a good point. That's a good point. So you would think, so what you're saying, just so I understand, is that maybe the, a good control would be what age did you join the army? Right. So how old were you? So I, mean, I want to be, I want to be comparing, right? So somebody that's, you know, so you're basically yeah. have this arbitrary cutoff of, of 26, right? This is exogenous. Right. But maybe it's not in the sense that if how old I was when I joined the army influences my decision on whether or not I want to enlist, regardless of health insurance. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. And, and that's not hard to do because I can see the the, year, the term of the contract, so I just take their date minus the term of the contract. I back that out. That's not hard to do. I think that's a really good point. Right, right. Yeah, and there's some of that too, right? There's folks that this is the life, maybe they were raised in the Army, joined at 18, and that's all they know. So, But I think that's a great. So again, wow, the interest of time. Time goes fast, Joe. So, so we have the traditional diff and diff. And here's our main result. So we just run in our first column. We're just going to go ahead and just run the kind of naive regression, no controls, just the difference in differences. And as we go along, I'm going to add demographic controls, individual to the soldier. I'm going to add what we kind of call army controls because we have lack of a better term. This is like branch and rank and all these kind of things. We're going to put those in. And then we're going to put state home of record controls. And it shows that pretty much that, uh, that result here on that third row stays pretty consistent, which is what we would hope for if, if we have as good a random assignment, right? Or good covariate balance. You should mention that when you need a minus sign, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it was pointed out that I, I think something happened when I transferred this from were to list a, all these second rows should be negative, right? And so again, this is a, a, on about a 50% means. Base, so yeah. 5, 5%. Yep, so you see 2.5 percentage point. Yeah. Miles supply it roughly by two, because about half except. So it's about a 5% reduction. Which, it's always fun when you teach non-economists, like, oh, 5%, that's not a lot. And you're like, no, human behavior, 5% is awesome, right? So. I don't know anything about drawdown. Is this sure. occurring kind of at a national level, or does it matter where you're stationed? Is that kind of the drawdown is going to be on a national level, yeah, because um, station doesn't really matter in the Army culture. It's like a great example is that a lieutenant is, is just a widget in the big old ar green Army machine is, the rule, is what the slang is, right? And you're moved by needs of the Army. And so... I know there's lots of congressmen, not necessarily on drawdowns, troop levels, but on like troop movements. Like if I move a brigade from one place to another, Congress decides that. That's called the BRAC, which I think California kind of went through, at least up in the Sacramento area. That we would maybe worry about some kind of endogeneity there, but. Mm -hmm. I just wondered because it was, it was really interesting just the way it looks like maybe economic conditions and drawdown were affecting re-enlistment rates. So I guess if you have just a general, if it's at the national, if you have just a general time trend in there, then that would. Yeah, yeah. If you have a time trend in the model. Or what we could do is state by year fixed effects, right? Like home of record state by year fixed effects, because different states are experiencing heterogeneous shocks, right? So if my home state is hurt really bad, then I might be willing to stay in the army more in a given year. Where if back home, I'm North Dakota and the economy's booming and I could go work in the oil fields, maybe I would want to get out at higher rates. So. All right, so we kind of went over what that means. Really quick in the interest of time, I think the biggest table that kind of cinches this for us is these placebo tests. So we might be worried about confounding factors. We might be worried about bandwidth choices from the Slutsky paper. So what we're going to follow is Depew and Abramowitz that kind of came up with this idea, 
We're going to first estimate a model with a counterfactual saying, let's pretend the ACA is passed in 2009 instead of 2010. So that will test the time dimension of the definitive. And then let's say that 27 to 29 year olds are treated and 30 to 33 year olds are control now. And what we would want to see is we'd want to see both these regressions, the result go away, and only find the result when the two are merged on top of each other, when we use the true policy options. And this might alleviate any concerns about, I'm worried about the GI Bill getting people out more because post 9-11 GI Bill was more generous than the Montgomery one, or troop drawdowns, right? So here's, here's what we find. When we claim this placebo enactment in 2009, the result goes away, becomes very close to zero and statistically insignificant. Uh, when we do the 28 to 30, or actually that should be 27 to 30, excuse me, 27 to 30 year olds, and 30 to 33 year olds as the, man, we messed that one up, as a placebo position, that goes away as well. So we're gonna treat half my control group as treated and if there's any confounders that you're worried about, you would assume those just get netted out and you wouldn't see. If we saw a drop down, and maybe that's ran by age, as has been kind of pointed out, then we would, hope, we would see that drawdown happen here as well. And we don't see that. Please. It seems like you... It seems like you might have enough observations if you wanted to do a yet another robustness chest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I like robustness chests. They, they make me sleep better at night. So maybe just twenty-five versus twenty-seven. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, so I can move. You're thinking moving the age cutout around, cut off around? Um, just so you're comparing even more similar groups. Yeah. So maybe what we could do. I mean, now that you got me thinking about it, maybe we could do the exact same thing as two but have both groups be in the treated group, right? And then we'd want to see a netting out. Is that what so, you're thinking? So I'm actually saying you still have a treatment and okay. control, so you're hoping to see an effect still, but now your treatment and control are even closer. Oh, okay. So we're shrinking the bandwidth. Even okay. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay. Just in case we're worried that 23-year-olds and 27-year-olds are different in some ways. Yeah, okay. Great. I mean, if I were going to be annoying, I'd say, right, that the confidence interval around, it's not particularly precise, that test sort of around the, around the ages to rule out. Sure, the rule out my effect, the right? effect size that you're finding for the treatment group better for the timing you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, no, that's true. That is true. We would want that standard error to be even smaller. And then it, this gets into debates on what true p-values are, right? Like, which are always fun debates to have with referees. So. So we, we would claim we'd only find our results like 5% of the time if you did random draws. So, or may, And then like maybe we'd just do an event study and show nothing, nothing, bounce. That's always nice to do. And maybe do that on the age dimension as well. So well, those, are, those are great ideas. And then we're going over, so I know people don't like that. But we do this heterogeneous treatment effect stuff. And was pointed out to me that this is a mistake. These need to be negative as well. So thank you for pointing that out to me beforehand. But what we'd want to see is we would want to see people who are most likely to have parents with health insurance driving our results. And so we see that with, with uh, white. Hispanic is somewhat there, but it's not, it's marginally significant. We see that with male. Female, there's just shrinking. So we probably could see the female. What I think is interesting is we see this really big with college grads that are in the army, that enlisted, and they probably have the highest opportunity cost of remaining in, right? And so we see, we see that there's a, when we just conditional on college grads, they seem to be the ones that would maybe want to move the most, and if we had a job lock story, they might feel like they have to stay in the most for the TRICARE benefit, and so because of this, they, they move at higher rates. So, I mean, I see what you're getting. You're trying to find where the, the parents, that you don't have data on parents, right? Sure. Like they have. But I found a more interesting sort of story about, and maybe that's what's coming up next, about, about the, tal the talent part. About yeah. What, are the, what is the... What is the selection of folks who are leaving, and is that sort of good or bad? So that's how I'm kind of thinking about. Sure. It it's because you've you've hung out with Dave Lyles as long as I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so right. I'll, I'll show this video to him too, Joe. So, <laughs> but I think we're kind of getting at that with this column here. But that's definitely something maybe I would want to expand. So to answer your question, Joe, and I know we're running out of time, I just jump. We find similar things with the triple diff. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is the next uh, steps, right? So my promo self-promotion here is 
uh, we got the permission, this is going to be good. We're going to merge this onto the National Clearinghouse data. So if any of you have worked on that before, this is a big data set where you give them, uh, this has been de-identified and the merger's already happened, it's been cleaned up, but essentially you can track when someone goes to college or not. So then I'm going to be able to see, did this person leave and then go to college? And did that person graduate from college? So the final part I think that gets at your question, Joe, is did the, where did these guys go? Right? And I think that's like the big question. Did they go to better jobs? Because then that would show us the job lock opportunity story. That's hard to tease out because treasury data is really hard to merge with, right? They're, but the National Clearing Student House, one, it gets me back to my ed roots, right? And, and, and two, it gives us this story. Maybe they're leaving the Army for a better opportunity by going to college. And what type of college are they going to? And then are they highly talented people that are leaving, right? Because they're more aptable to go to college. And so that's one thing that we're going to do here is put it on the national, we're going to add in these national clearinghouse stories as the second half of this paper. What's the emerging variables, social security? Uh, I'm not sure because they don't let me play with those things. They do, they do it for you. <laughs> yeah, they do it for me. And all this is de-identified. So IRB, IRB, if you're listening, we're, 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 we followed all that, right? So. And then for, just as a question for when you get to that step, is there something to track the use of the GI Bill for education? Ooh, we do have that, yeah. So that would be a good one, too. I think it would be really you know, important looking at if people are going to go to school after they've been in the military. I mean, I have a roommate right now who's going back to school because he was in the military. That was his that's whole plan. That's one of the most valuable benefits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I have another paper we're trying to finish up right now that looks at for-profit university pricing. So it was kind of cool with the GI Bill benefit, it was reauthorized. So it used to be the state with the highest, it used to be your max GI benefit was set to the highest public university's tuition rate in the state, if that makes sense. And then at the reauthorization, the DOD sent it to one flat rate. And so you have all these states that randomly got boosted and randomly got cut. And what we find is for-profit for university in a state where it got boosted raised their tuition to take in that benefit. So you get a nice Bennett hypothesis story if you're familiar with that. So well, last thing, I, 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 I'm still interested in what this does to the Army. Yeah, yeah. You're focusing on what happens to the and better opportunities. Right. I, I guess I'm interested in, and I know there's no neat sort of cut off probably natural experiments to sort of look, look at an age cutoffs in, in terms of performance of remain, well maybe there is, and sort of some measures of performance or productivity sure. of those who sort of remain. I, I guess yeah. I want to know what this does to the production of this public good of national defense. Or maybe, or maybe is it people who are rated highly that left, right? Yeah, that's so. right. And I want to, uh, yeah, I, 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 No, that's a really I, good part I, I wanna, we hadn't thought know. about. I mean, that's what makes this different. I understand that you're trying to sort of pitch the paper as sort of linking the, the superiority of these data relative to traditional labor market data and what more you can say. But I'm also interested in the uniqueness sure. of the, 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 the army setting and what they're they no, and do and, and what it means for the production of this public good. So, so, so first off, I would claim, because I don't have that right now in the estimation, I would say it obviously is bad for the army, right? People are leaving. We've got to replace these folks, retrain them. That's very costly, right? But uh, what I think is always interesting, and I always like to include this paragraph, because sometimes referees say, well, the Army, we don't care about it, right? And uh, Abby Wozniak showed me this statistic that uh, they put in their paper, which I thought was cool, is when we look at the end here, this is 100,000 people and even more because we're cutting the data in a certain way. So I think it's about Army troop levels are about 400,000 enlisted folks right now, which is comparable to the community college population. So if you look at all the journals and all the articles and that exist for community college students that we worry all about, they're huge and we should worry. But when you look about how much research is done on the DOD, it's very, very small. And how much of the federal budget is done on the DOD. And this is a pitch for our data, but also a pitch for my research agenda. Like there's just a lot we don't know about a very, very important part of our society. So. What populations are you saying are similarly sized? Uh, well, community college students in a given year if I remember the look. So I think if you add Army, Navy, and Air Force together, it's somewhat similar to community college students, is what I read. So. Maybe graduates. Really. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's graduates. But, anyways, huge population when you add in all the services together. The Army is the biggest one of 400,000. 
and I think it comes roughly out to be about a million enlisted folks. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.